I almost forgot. I'd hate to deprive you of this. Salvation lies within. Salvation lies within. Salvation lies within. Yes, sir. Sufficient and necessary is the most commonly tested form of reasoning that appears on the LSAT. In this free series, we will review this concept of formal logic with the most important examples anyone has ever used. Freely I have received, so freely I give. Hallelujah. But first, let's review why the rules of sufficient and necessary are so important. Sufficient and necessary conditions aren't just abstract logic puzzles. They are the bedrock of truth in reasoning. They allow us to draw conclusions that aren't opinion, but certainty. Let's define these terms. A condition X is said to be sufficient for another condition Y if, and only if, the truth, existence, or occurrence of X guarantees the truth, existence, or occurrence of Y. A condition Y is said to be necessary for another condition X if, and only if, the absence of Y guarantees the absence of X. In other words, if Y is necessary, then the non-existence of Y means the existence of X cannot be true. This is called the contrapositive, and it's logically identical to the original statement. Think of it like this. You need oxygen to live. So if someone is alive, they must have oxygen. But here's what that really means. If there's no oxygen, there can be no life. That's not a guess. That's truth that must follow. Let's review. If someone is alive, they must have oxygen. This must be true and is called the positive argument structure. But what if someone's not alive? That tells us nothing about oxygen. Think about someone in a hospital, hooked up to oxygen, who flatlines. They're gone, but the oxygen is still flowing. Don't just negate. And the same example proves something else too. Even if someone has oxygen, that doesn't guarantee they're alive. Don't just reverse. To draw a truth that must follow, you have to reverse and negate. This is the contrapositive, and it's just as true as the original. Reverse and negate. That's our motto when it comes to sufficient and necessary, and that's how we arrive at what must be true. These rules of formal logic, like the rules of math, guard against contradiction. Ignore them, and you risk flawed reasoning. It's like saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. You've left the truth behind. Not surprisingly, one of the most commonly tested questions on the logical reasoning portion of the LSAT asks you to determine what must be true. And yet, many students struggle with this concept. Maybe it's because the topics are often abstract theories, like space, dinosaurs, and evolution. For this reason, these questions always begin with a hedge, a built-in disclaimer. If all of the statements in the passage are true, why? Because Elsac knows that the premises might not be true at all. They could be fiction, but your job is to accept them for the sake of argument. But what if your premises came from a source that is infallible? What if your starting point wasn't man's imagination, but the words of the living God? Then your conclusions wouldn't just be hypothetically true, they'd be undeniably true. Now you may be thinking, why use the Bible as the source of truth? Simple. First, it claims to be just that. Second, whether you believe in it or not, this book has shaped laws, civilizations, and entire worldviews. It's the best-selling book of all time, quoted in courtrooms, whispered in hospitals, and placed in nearly every hotel room across America. It's printed on the bottom of in-and-out cups. It's why Chick-fil-A closes on Sundays. It's at the center of the ever-polarizing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it's influencing American politics and national priorities more openly than ever before. Many people have told me that God 
spared my life for a reason. A reason you think you were spared? I mean, the only thing I can think is that God loves our country and he thinks we're going to bring our country back. He wants to bring it back. Somebody said to me the other day, you're the most famous person in the world by far. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. They said, yes, you are. I said, no. They said, who's more famous? I said, Jesus Christ. Ow! Faith in Christ. As you can see, this isn't subtle anymore. It's on the record. It's on the campaign trail. And soon, it won't just shape elections. It'll shape everyday life. But before we let it do that, shouldn't we take the time to test its validity? Not emotionally, not traditionally, but logically. And that brings us to you, the viewer. We're not asking you to accept the Bible blindly. We're asking you to reason with it to treat it like any other set of premises and test its claims with logic. If it contradicts itself, dismiss it. But if it doesn't, then the problem might not be with the Word of God, but with everything we've been told about it. After all, Let God be true, but every man a liar. But every man a liar. But every man a liar. So if man, then liar. Is your pastor, priest, rabbi, or imam a man? What about the author of your Bible commentary? What about this guy? Then why not test what they say against what God actually says? And that's exactly what this series will do. But herein lies the problem. Once we start applying formal logic to the Bible, there's no going back. So before we officially cross that line, you need to hear the warning.